If you think of an old ocean liner that is sinking, what is one thing that might come to mind first from such a scenario? Well, stories like the sinking of the Titanic in 1912 immortalized one line in particular, women and children first. For a long time, I never really thought about it, assuming it was just the mindset of the time to get the most vulnerable off a ship before everyone else. A courteous thing. Maybe because there weren't enough lifeboats for everyone? But actually, women and children first comes from a tragic event. One that has been all but forgotten today, but it is an incredible story, and it still lives on in its legacy. Today, I'm going to tell you the story of the HMS Birkenhead, which sank in 1852 at Danger Point. If you enjoy stories and content like this, and you want to see more like it, like and subscribe so that I know you want more of it. Okay, let's get to the story. Birkenhead began her career as a simple frigate with the name HMS Vulcan, the name of the character mounted on the front of the ship, Vulcan being the god of fire in Roman mythology. The ship was laid at Birkenhead, England, and launched on December 30th, 1845. She was very quickly renamed to HMS Birkenhead. The ship was 210 feet long, and she had two steam engines which could produce 564 horsepower. Like other early steamships from the time, such as the Collins Line passenger liners, like the SS Pacific, she was propelled by two paddle wheels, which were 20 feet in diameter. The ship also had eight watertight compartments, which could be closed off in the event of flooding, but because of the way certain bulkheads were positioned, the actual total of watertight compartments was 12. She also had two masts, with a third being added later which could be used for sail power if the need arose, and at the time it often did. Back then, it wasn't at all unusual for ships to break down and be weeks overdue because of mechanical problems. Take the story of the passenger liner California, for example, from 1881. She was discovered by the SS Bywell Castle having been drifting helpless in the ocean due to her engines breaking down. She was nearly a thousand miles from land when she was discovered and towed back to land. This kind of thing happened all the time back then, so having an alternative means for propelling your ship across the ocean in the event of your engines failing was a good precaution. Inside Birkenhead, her engines and compartments were protected by a strong body because she had an iron hull. She was reclassified as a troop ship in 1851. She never actually got the chance to serve as a frigate, and there were two reasons for this. The Royal Navy warships were switched from paddle wheels to propeller propulsion, as recent experiments from the time showed that this was a much more efficient method of propelling your ship, outclassing paddle wheels. The second reason was that the Admiralty had doubts about the effects of cannon shots against iron hulls. Recent experiments had also shown that cannonball striking an iron hull led to a hole which could be hard if not impossible to plug back up. Birkenhead's maiden voyage was in 1846, and the ship traveled to Plymouth, keeping an average speed of 12 to 13 knots throughout the voyage. She had sporadic use around England, Ireland, and Scotland over the next few years. HMS Birkenhead assisted in the refloating of the SS Great Britain. Britain? The SS Great Britain. <laughs> SS Great Britain, not Bitten. The SS Great Britain was a fellow iron ship, and it's actually a ship that still exists today, preserved as a museum ship. An exciting moment in Birkenhead's career also came when she ran down and sank the brig Ontario in the English Channel. The owners of the ship then sued for the loss. Birkenhead was found to be at fault for the incident, as she had no lookout posted at the time due to her crew being short-handed. Birkenhead never served as a warship, but she did carry those entrusted to her on fast and more comfortable trips than her fellow wooden sail-powered ships. Now then, that's enough history. Let's get to what you all clicked on the video for, the incident that was the catalyst for the infamous Women and Children First Protocol in a disaster scenario. HMS Birkenhead left Portsmouth in January 1852 under the command of Captain Robert Salmond. She was convoying troops from 10 different regiments 
who were all going down to the Cape Colony to fight in the Eighth Kosha War. The Eighth. Okay. She picked up additional officers and soldiers in Queenstown, including the families of the officers, their wives and children. When she docked briefly near Cape Town on February 25, 1852, most of the women and children disembarked along with several soldiers who had fallen ill. Nine cavalry horses were loaded onto the ship, along with an additional 35 tons of coal to feed the ship for the last leg of the voyage. From there, HMS Birkenhead departed from Simons Bay at 1800 hours, with possibly as many as 643 men, women, and children on board her. The exact number is unknown, and I'll explain why in a little bit. Deciding to make the best speed possible, Captain Salmon chose to have the ship hug the South African coast, keeping within three miles from the shore. Using her paddle wheels, the Birkenhead kept up a steady speed of 8.5 knots, and the sea was calm and the night was clear as they headed out of False Bay to the east. Shortly before 2 o'clock in the morning on February 26th, Birkenhead was traveling at about 8 knots. She was keeping good speed up and sailing with no issues. Her passengers were being carried reliably to their destination. The captain decided to check the depth, and the leadsman made a sounding of 12 fathoms. Before they had a chance to make a second sounding, there was a monstrous crash that likely threw everyone off their feet and onto the deck. HMS Birkenhead had struck an uncharted rock, and I'm sure the calamity was like a monstrous crash in what had been moments earlier a quiet and still night. The rock still lies near Danger Point to this day, and we have its exact coordinates. You can easily go see it, especially if the ocean is rough. But in calm seas, it's harder to spot, and on a calm night, it would have been near impossible. The HMS Birkenhead's forward section was sitting in water at two fathoms deep, while her stern sat in water eleven fathoms deep. The captain ordered the engines to be reversed and the anchor dropped. The ship backed off the rock, but the water now gushed freely into a giant open hole in her hull. At this point, the ship was lost, even with watertight bulkheads, and the inevitable could only be delayed, not prevented. The HMS Birkenhead was sinking. As water filled the ship with what I'm sure was a tumultuous crashing and roaring, no doubt everyone on board was rushing to assess the damage and help the civilians get out on deck from below, but the water would have kept rising and everyone would have quickly realized that the ship was lost. And like with the Titanic, perhaps the event where women and children first is remembered most and associated most with today? There were insufficient lifeboats for everyone on board when the Birkenhead began to go down. And that situation was only made worse. And I'll explain why in just a second. 60 men began working and trying to pump the water out of the ship, but it only took minutes for the forwardmost compartments to flood. And this happened so fast that over 100 sailors drowned in their berths before they even had a chance to react or escape the flooding. The survivors began to gather out on deck as another 60 men were assigned to the tackles of the lifeboats while everyone else was gathered aft on the poop deck to balance out the weight of the water and raise the bow section. Now, the lifeboat situation was made unfortunate by what happened next. The ship's number of lifeboats were already limited, but as water rushed down the corridors and filled the interior of the ship, two of the large boats were loaded. These could hold 150 people each, but one was swamped and the other was unable to be launched due to the poor maintenance, paint, and just general upkeep of the winches. I'm not sure why they couldn't maybe float them off as the ship went down, but they couldn't. And this meant only the smaller lifeboats were available to be used in the evacuation of the ship. And there were only three of these. Everyone still alive assembled on the deck, and Lieutenant Colonel Seton of the 74th Foot took charge of all military personnel. He stressed the importance of keeping calm and maintaining order among his officers and adhering to the discipline that they were trained to have in such situations. One survivor described the situation as this. Almost everybody kept silent. Indeed, nothing was heard, but the kicking of the horses and the orders of Salmon, all given in a clear, firm voice. Due to the limited space on the lifeboats, women and children were prioritized and put into the boats first. This was the first time in history where the very concept of putting women and children into the boats first was used. 
doing so would later become known as a Birkenhead Drill. It became standard following this event in evacuations of ships as a courageous behavior in hopeless circumstances. Knowing that if everyone jumped ship and rushed the lifeboats, they would be swamped and the women and children would be drowned, Colonel Stetton ordered his men to stand fast and stay on the ship, and only three jumped ship and made for the lifeboats. Though the horses which were on board were freed and driven into the sea in the hopes that they'd be able to swim to shore, eight of them managed to do it with the ninth breaking its leg and I don't think it survived. The soldiers, meanwhile, stood together on the deck, shoulder to shoulder, until the very end, even as the ship broke apart underneath them. Ten minutes after the first collision, the ship's engines were still turning astern, and the Bergenhead again struck the rocks beneath the engine, this time completely tearing open her bottom, and she broke apart right away, just after the main mast, throwing several people into the sea and causing her funnel to collapse and fall off the side. The forward section of the ship went down instantly, and the stern remained afloat, crowded with soldiers. They stayed together on deck, no one moved, and the ship continued to break apart and sink. It's a tragic image to imagine, but also kind of inspiring, too. These men likely were terrified, but held to their training and discipline and stood bravely and calmly together on the deck as the ship sank out from underneath them. Birkenhead sank only 20 minutes after the first collision. A few soldiers from the ship managed to swim the two miles to shore over the next 12 hours, hanging onto the breeze to help keep them afloat, but most were drowned or eaten by sharks. One survivor of the sinking, a Lieutenant J.F.G. of the 43rd Light Infantry, said this in a letter to his father. I remained on the wreck until she went down. The suction took me down some way, and a man got a hold of my leg, but I managed to kick him off, and came up and struck out for some pieces of wood that were on the water and started for land, about two miles off. I was in the water about five hours, as the shore was so rocky and the surf ran so high that a great many were lost trying to land. Nearly all those that took to the water without their clothes on were taken by sharks. Hundreds of them were all around us. I saw men taken by them close to me, but as I was dressed, having on a flannel shirt and trousers, they preferred the others. I was not in the least hurt, and am happy to say, kept my head clear. Most of the officers lost their lives from losing their patience of mind and trying to take the money with them, and from not throwing off their coats. The morning after the sinking, the schooner Lioness found the wreck site and rescued the survivors. 193 people in three lifeboats survived, out of the 638 who had been on board. The survivors consisted, as best as we can guess, due to the record books of all who had been on board going down with the ship, of 113 soldiers, 6 Royal Marines, 54 seamen, 7 women, 13 children, and one male civilian. The highest ranking survivor of the sinking was Captain Edward W.C. Wright of the 91st Argyshire Regiment, and he was made a brevet major for his actions during the ordeal. So, what do you think happened after the sinking to the sailors who had been on the ship? Well, a bunch of them were court-martialed. Yeah. As you can imagine, this drew a great deal of public interest. The court hearing occurred on the 8th of May, 1852, on board HMS Victory in Portsmouth. Fun fact, the HMS Victory also is a ship that still exists, and it is actually the oldest Navy warship still in service in the world. None of the senior naval officers of the Birkenhead survived, and none of those brought forward at the trial were found blameworthy for the accident. Those who were there testified how order and regularity prevailed on the ship, from the moment it struck the rock until the very end when she disappeared. They added that, that there was no confusion or noise as everyone followed their orders, like they always did, even though their ship was going down. Like I said, it's kinda inspiring that these soldiers stood together on deck until the end, likely knowing they were not going to survive. I'm clearly not the only one who thought so. 
Frederick William IV of Parasia, was so impressed by the valor and bravery and discipline those on board had until the very end that he ordered an account of the story was to be read at the head of every regiment in his army. A lighthouse was erected near Danger Point to warn shipping of the dangerous reef, and it stands like a sentinel, overlooking the spot where the ship went down. The lighthouse is 59 feet tall, can be seen from 25 nautical miles away, and still stands to this day. A memorial plaque was added to it later on. Another memorial was put up at the Chelsea Royal Hospital, ordered by Queen Victoria herself. Thomas M. M. Hemi painted a depiction of the sinking in 1892, titled The Wreck of the Birkenhead, showing everyone standing on the deck to the end. I featured it earlier in this video. In 1977, the South African Mint issued a gold coin commemorating the 125th anniversary of the sinking. Though the ship has kind of fallen into obscurity today, it does still hold a powerful and potent legacy including a rumor that she was carrying a military payroll consisting of three tons of gold coins, totaling of worth of 240,000 pounds. The rumor says they'd been stored in the powder room before the ship left on its final voyage, and that they went down with the ship when it sank. There have been numerous attempts made to salvage the gold. The wreck has also been found. The water it sank in wasn't deep, so it wasn't terribly hard to find. More on that in just a minute. The Salomon's Dam Nature Reserve in South Africa is also supposedly named after Birkenhead's captain, Robert Salmon. Also, locals to the area still call the great white sharks in that area Tommy Sharks, in reference to the Tommies eaten by the sharks in the water during the sinking, Tommies being a slang term for common soldiers in the British Army. Another legacy of this incident was, of course, Women and children first, becoming standard for evacuation in a scenario where a ship was sinking or just needed evacuation, becoming best known for its association with and its use during the sinking of the Titanic in 1912. I, like most people today probably did, first heard of the protocol in relation to the story of the Titanic. This protocol is known as a Birkenhead drill, and after this incident, the practice of women and children first became standard in evacuation of a sinking ship. The wreck of the Birkenhead is, as you can imagine, a bit of a mangled mess, considering the ship's violent end where it was tearing itself apart. But a few bits are still identifiable, such as the paddle wheel shaft you see on screen now. The wreck isn't in deep water, only 98 feet down. You can dive down and see it. And I'm not sure when it was first discovered, I couldn't find a date, but people were visiting it by 1958. And many people have visited it since. One reason people dive down is to try their hand at finding the gold coins supposedly held within the ship. Whether or not any are really down there is unknown. The wreck is frequently visited and disturbed, despite being a war grave. The 1958 visit tried to find the gold, but all the salvage team recovered was some brass and anchors. The only gold coins ever found at the site seem to have been ones the passengers and crew had on themselves as the ship sank. If a large cargo of gold coins exist, they still rest somewhere within the hull, undiscovered to this day. In 1989, the British and South African government officially agreed to share the gold between them if it was ever recovered. But if any is actually down there in the wreck remains unknown. So now you know where the protocol, Women and Children First, originated from, and became standard following in scenarios where a ship was sinking, and why that practice is known as a Birkenhead drill. This story is tragic, but like I said, it's also inspirational. I'm sure this story is more widely known in the UK than it is in the US, but I wish it were known by more people. It's really something, and I'm happy to have learned it, and I hope I did it justice, and it just deserves to be remembered. And if there actually is a bunch of gold down there, I hope it stays down there. It should stay with the ship if it's there. Alright, that's gonna wrap it up for now. 
If you enjoyed the video and you want to see more like it, check out my video about the disappearance of the SS Waratah, my video on a ghost ship that killed one third of Norway's population back in the 14th century, my video about the sinking of the HMS Eurydice, and my video about the sinking of the Felicity Ace, and my whole series dedicated to ships which vanished at sea. And just in time for my dog to start barking. I'll link a few of them in the description of the video. Okay, that's... He does it every time. That's going to do it for this one. Thank you for watching, and I hope to see you in the next video. Have a good one, everyone.